Hello, and welcome to this video for Physics 132, which covers some more basics on the idea of interference. This video assumes that you have already read the corresponding textbook section on the basics of interference, and in this video we will expand upon some of the ideas presented in your text. First things first, what kind of waves will interfere, and why do we care? Well, any type of wave will interfere with another wave of the same type. For example, sound waves will interfere with other sound waves, light waves will interfere with other light waves, electron waves will interfere with other electron waves, and so forth. So that's what types of waves will interfere. So why do we care about interference? Why are we studying this topic? Well, interference is a critical attribute of waves used in modern science. For example, spectral analysis. You may know that if you spread the light out from a burning sample, you can look at the pattern of lines to determine what elements are in the sample. This technique used to be done with prisms. However, nowadays, prisms are almost never used, and instead, slits are instead. X-ray diffraction is another application of the idea of interference in modern science. This picture might be familiar to a good number of you because it is the it is the picture that established the double helix structure of DNA. This was done by diffracting X-rays off of individual atoms and looking at the resulting pattern. This technique of diffraction is still used to determine structure, and not only with X-rays. Now, even things like electron or neutron diffraction can be sometimes used. Another application of interference is through diffracting molecules themselves. Molecules as large as Buckminster Fullerene, also known as buckyballs, with formula C60, so they have this little ball shape of carbon atoms, have been diffracted. And by looking at how these molecules are diffracted and how those waves interfere with each other, we can learn about their properties. And viruses could be next. It is possible, at least theoretically, to create an interference of virus waves with themselves and use that to learn about the properties of viruses. No one has done this yet, but this might be a possibility in the future. So if light interferes with light, why don't we see the interference of light all the time? I'm going to reframe this question into why do we generally need a laser to see the effects of light interfering. Well, in a laser, the light is traveling in lockstep with itself, like our marching band members here at the Rose Bowl Parade. This is just a property of lasers, that the light is emitted in such a way that the peaks and the troughs of the light waves line up. Such light is called coherent light, and is just a feature of laser light. However, there are other ways to get light to be coherent. In most everyday light, on the other hand, the waves are not in step, and we're just seeing some sort of average. So here in the figure on the right, you can see LED light, which is a single wavelength, one color, or monochromatic, but the waves are not in phase. You have peaks and lining up with troughs, and you've got a whole bunch of different waves going together, and what you see is some sort of average. Sunlight is complicated even further because you have a variety of different wavelengths traveling along together and the peaks not lining up. Since interference is the result of peaks canceling troughs, this really only works with coherent light. There's one more important thing about superposition of waves, and it is basically that while the intensity of a wave is what we typically observe, it is not what adds when we look at interference. Remember, intensities are related to the square of the amplitude, or for light specifically, the intensity is one half the speed of light times this epsilon nut number times the amplitude squared. Since intensity is related to the amplitude squared, intensity will always be positive and there would never be a way to get the cancellation that we observe. How should you remember this? Well, I like to say, thou shalt add amplitudes, thou shalt not add intensities. So if you've got intensity, you have to go back to amplitude, 
add them, including any signs, so sometimes you might be subtracting, and then go back to intensity. Yeah, this is kind of annoying, but it's the way nature works, so what are you going to do about it? So here's an example of converting from intensity back to amplitude to determine interference. So let's see I have a white light wave with an intensity of 25 watts per square meter. And that wave lines up peak to peak with another wave of 25 watts per square meter. What will the resulting intensity be? Well, I know that the intensity of a light wave is one half the speed of light times epsilon naught times the amplitude squared, which rearranging gives me an amplitude per wave of 137.2 newtons per coulomb. Now I go and add the two waves together. So since the two waves are identical, the total amplitude will just be double the initial amplitude, 274.5 newtons per coulomb. Now I go back and recalculate the intensity with this value. Intensity of 100 watts per square meter. So you'll notice that in fact, the intensity did not double. It's not 25 plus 25, that would be 50. No, the intensity actually quadrupled. And this should make sense because intensity is related to amplitude squared. So in summary, interference is an important phenomenon in modern science. In that interference of light is good for looking at spectra to determine chemical composition. And interference of light is useful for techniques like X-ray diffraction to determine the structure of molecules. Similarly, the interference of matter waves is good for learning about molecular structure as well. One example is through a new technique called neutron interference. By bringing two waves together of the same type, I will always get interference. However, I only observe interference really with coherent light. I need all the waves to be marching along together as opposed to most everyday light, which is just kind of an average result of a bunch of different waves that are all sort of walking along at their own pace. Finally, I would like you to remember that thou shalt add amplitudes. Thou shalt not add intensities. So if you've got intensity and you need to see how things interfere, you gotta go back to amplitude first and then add or subtract as appropriate and then go back. This concludes this video.